Today we look at chapter 5 here in Matthew, verses 21 through 26. We're looking at the spirit of the law, the law of Moses, and you'll see what I mean in just a moment. But let's begin reading together at verse 21. I'll read to verse 26, and we'll get into our study. Matthew chapter 5, beginning at verse 21, reading to verse 26. Jesus said, You have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not murder, and whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. But I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. Whoever says to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whoever says, you fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Agree with your adversary quickly while you are on the way with him lest your adversary deliver you to the judge, the judge hand you over to the officer, and you be thrown into prison. Assuredly, I say to you, you will by no means get out of there till you have paid the last penny. In verse 20, Jesus Christ made a statement. Let's use that verse as a platform to move into the other verses, because in verse 20 here in chapter 5, he had said this, he said, For I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. When Jesus said that, he was making a very strong statement. He was saying, My followers must exhibit greater righteousness than that of the scribes and that of the Pharisees. And in saying that, Jesus was slamming the door shut on what has been called works righteousness. You see, this statement that he was making would have completely shocked those who were listening to him on that day. You see, the scribes were the religious experts. They were, they were the teachers of the law of Moses. The Pharisees were a small but very powerful and influential religious group. And they were the bar that was used at that time to measure righteousness by. Now, as mentioned, the Pharisees were small numerically, but large when it came to influence. Just the name Pharisee gives to us insight in how they lived their lives. The word Pharisee literally is translated, one who separates himself. And that's exactly what the Pharisees did. They were known for keeping themselves pure. They were known for staying away from those who were impure. To become a Pharisee required that you would do certain things. You would pledge yourself in the presence of three Pharisees to a strict adherence of Levitical purity, separation from ignorant and carelessly vulgar people, the scrupulous payment of tithes, the support of priests, and a conscientious regard for vows and other people's property. They attempted to cultivate a perfect heart that feared the very thought of sin, the avoidance of sin springing from love for God, the fulfillment of his commandments without expectation of reward, and the avoidance of any impure thought or any act that may lead to sin. And that lifestyle resulted in their being regarded as extremely righteous people. They were so respected that the ordinary people of their day knew that they would never be able to measure up to the righteousness of a scribe or a Pharisee. But amazingly, the Lord Jesus Christ is telling his would-be followers that their righteousness must exceed the righteousness that was attributed to Pharisees. So in the mind of his listeners, the door would have immediately been shut to them. Who amongst them could have a greater righteousness than that of a scribe, that of a Pharisee? Well, what we're going to be seeing here is that with all their efforts, they were still falling short of what Jesus would say is true righteousness. The result of their pursuit of righteousness would never satisfy the longing of a heart because their works could never produce a satisfied heart that was pure. But Jesus' grace could. Remember in chapter 5 and verse 8 how he simply had said, Blessed are the pure in heart, they shall see God. The Pharisees, in reality, were not pure in heart, and thus they were not going to have a relationship with God because they were building their lives 
on self-righteousness and not the righteousness that results from humility and seeking God for forgiveness. Their righteousness was really an outward righteousness. It was a show, if you will, but it wasn't an inward condition. The result of all of their disciplined efforts actually caused them to become proud and self-righteous. And that's possible, by the way, to be so religious that you become proud of being so religious. I had a guy very early in my Christian walk whom uh, I, I, I knew. I was in my early 20s at the time. I believe his nickname was Lucky. And uh, I remember he had, a, a, unfortunately, he had a habit of boasting. He had a you know, an arrogance about him. I'm sorry to sound like I'm judging him, but that, that's truly how I was impressed by him. He was always bragging about things he did for God and all, and, and it really was more arrogance than anything else. And I was a young man, and he was an old man at that time. He was in his 40s. <laughs> yeah. And I remember speaking to him on one occasion. I was about 22 years old, 23. And I said to him, you know... Pride and arrogance is something that the Lord does not like. God gives grace to the humble, but he opposes the proud. And I'll never forget his response. He said, humble, humble. He goes, I am humble. I'm the most humble man I know. And he didn't see that. He didn't see how interesting that is. I mean, I am the most, he was proud of his humility. How is that possible? But he was. And it's possible for us to get caught up with the outer trappings of religiosity and to miss the, the most important thing, which is the condition of the heart. And that's what had happened with the Pharisees. They wore the religion on the outside, but their hearts had not been recreated. They had not been cleansed. Jesus uses Pharisees very often as examples of those who are self-righteous. And one occasion in Luke chapter 18, for example, in verses 9 through 14, Luke writes to some who are confident of their own righteousness and look down on everybody else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood up and prayed about himself. God, I thank you that I am not like other men, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all that I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Jesus quite often would make reference to the Pharisees because the Pharisees were regarded in society as the most extraordinarily religious people. They were the standard. They were the bar of excellence. Now, from the introduction of this sermon, Jesus has been focusing on motivations of the heart because that's what God is most aware of what men are truly like in their minds and in their desires. And God's concern is for what men should have in him. And his concern is what they're pursuing. And he wants to know what they truly, he, he wants to reveal what we truly are without him. But God's desire, as it says in Psalm 51, 6, is he says, behold, you desire truth in the inward parts. It's easy for us to deceive ourselves into thinking that we're right in God's sight if we do all the right external things, if we have the right religiosity about us. You will we'll be seeing this as we go through the Sermon on the Mount, how they would pray and they would fast and they would give the three external demonstrations of being religious during the time of Christ. And yet, as Jesus will say so clearly, that they do this to be seen by men. It's easy to deceive ourselves into thinking that, that we are right in the sight of God, but Proverbs 16, verse 2 says it like this, all the ways of man are clean in his own sight, but the Lord weighs the motives. Someone once said, what you are in public will never blind God to what you are in private. And that agrees with Scripture, Hebrews 4, 13 
Nothing in all creation can hide from him. Everything is naked and exposed before his eyes. This is the God to whom we must explain all that we have done. We think we can hide from God, but we're not. I have a granddaughter. My granddaughter's uh, going to be three years old, and, and she thinks that sometimes she can hide from me. She thinks that she can go into the cupboard and find the gum, and she can hide from me. I have actually found her in my office under my desk with gum. She loves gum. And she's underneath the desk, and I'll be saying, Where, where's Stella? And I'll go walking around the desk, and there she is, and, and wrappers everywhere. <laughs> you know, and she thinks she's hiding from me. She'll come in. She'll even come in and, and, oh, hi, Papa, and she'll hug me. But her eye is somewhere else. It's like, okay, where's the stash? <laughs> and she'll go, and she'll go get the gum. We can do that. We, we think that we can hide from God what we really are, but the Bible says, no, everything is open, everything is exposed before the Lord. He sees it all, and God searches out. He searches out our heart, and God also weighs out our motives. In Jeremiah 17, 9 and 10, Jeremiah said, the heart is deceitful above all things, beyond cure. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, search the heart, examine the mind to reward a man according to his conduct, according to what his deeds deserve. And that's why Paul would pray for us. Paul would pray that the church would understand the grace of God. Paul would pray that, that we, the church, when we begin walking with the Lord, that we would be careful to know that all that we are comes from Him. And, and it's not what I do that makes Him love me. It's that He chose to love me in spite of what I was prior to coming to faith in Him. I was His enemy. I was hostily opposed to Him. I was not his friend. I was opposed in every way, and yet God loved me and sent his son Jesus to die on the cross. That's how I got saved. And now that I have a relationship with God, he would be very careful to remind me that it's through grace that I stand, and it's by faith that I was saved through the grace of God, and thus I need to hold fast to him at all times. And so he would tell the Ephesians in chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, that he, and this is what he was praying for them, that he, that God would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith and that you would be rooted and grounded in love. You see, the good deeds of the Pharisees did not come from cleansed hearts. They did not have the attributes of the Beatitudes. And their motives were not genuinely pure. Jesus will say in Matthew 23, 5, all their works they do to be seen by men. Now, people in general, all of us really, have the tendency of using external measurements to determine what we think is good. We can do the same thing when judging whether something is true or something's being blessed by God. Even Christian ministers and ministries can be judged by that kind of standard. The Apostle Paul was judged by people based on outer appearance. Now, if you ever read any historic references to Paul or even some of the things that he said concerning himself in his writings, you would discover that history records that the Apostle Paul was not an attractive man whatsoever. History re records that he had a, a, a large crooked nose, that he was slight in stature, his eyes were bulgy. He was not an attractive man. And when he was writing to the Corinthians, when you read and study 2 Corinthians, you'll discover that Paul, no less than 21 times in that book, no less than 21 times in 13 chapters, defends himself against accusations. And some of the accusations that came against the Apostle Paul by the Corinthian opponents related to his appearance and the way that he spoke. They said, well, he writes weighty letters, but in appearance he's weak, he's timid, he's cowardly. And they would say things concerning him to the degree that in 2 Corinthians 5, 12, he said this. He said, we do not commend ourselves again to you, but give you opportunity to boast on our behalf that you may have an answer for those who boast in appearance and not in heart. You see, God does not use outer appearance as his standard. He judges the motives of the person. Six times in the following verses, Jesus attacks the legalistic system that has replaced the word of God. And he begins each rebuke by either saying, you have heard, or it has been said. 
This phrase you have heard is what is called a rabbinical phrase. It, it relates to the teaching of rabbis. And so Jesus is utilizing their teaching to make it uh, very clear and to make a very important distinction. And the point that he's going to make, and we'll see this, is righteousness is a matter of the heart and not the externals only, which is why we need God's grace. And so he begins at verse 21 by saying it like this, You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder. Now, many of us were raised hearing the phrase, thou shalt not kill. And so there have been many arguments related to that, well, you're not to kill, and some have argued in many ways concerning that. You see that initially in Exodus chapter 20, verse 13, thou shalt not kill is the sixth commandment out of the Ten Commandments. It's really a command against murder. It's speaking of intentional killing. It is not speaking of the utilization of capital punishment. It is not speaking of something that can occur, that can occur in an accidental death where I'm, we'll say, driving my car and, and I accidentally collide with another car and somebody, a passenger or driver in the other vehicle dies. It's not speaking concerning that. Uh, it's, it's not speaking concerning warfare because there are times when there is a just and reasonable use of force in war. It isn't speaking about a person defending themselves against attack. Somebody has approached them as intending to do them physical harm, and in the course of trying to protect themselves, they take the other person's life. It's not speaking about that, nor is it speaking about you happening upon a crime and getting involved, and somehow, through the course of events, ending up taking the life of somebody as you were defending somebody else. None of that applies to this. This is speaking concerning intentional killing. And when Jesus is speaking about murder here in verse 21 and says, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, he continues by saying what they're being taught, and whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. When he does that, he's pointing out something very basic. You see, in their saying that whoever murders will be in danger of judgment, they would normally cross-reference and use another scripture to bolster their teaching. That scripture would have been Genesis chapter 9, verse 6. In Genesis 9, verse 6 says, Whoever sheds man's blood by man, his blood shall be shed, for in the image of God he made man. And so what they did is they took the scripture, Exodus 20, 13, they quoted it, you shall not murder. Then they added Genesis 9, verse 6 as the explanatory note to that verse, and we're teaching that. And the point is that it would seem that the Pharisees really didn't go far enough in the teaching concerning this. They saw murder as purely an external act. So they didn't go deep enough into this. They didn't go to the root. They didn't point out the spiritual cause that resulted in somebody murdering somebody else. And because that's inadequate, Jesus corrects their interpretation, and that's why he says, but I say to you, now you'll see this in, in a while when we get uh, to a certain point in, in the study where the people are going to marvel at the methodology of Jesus because in his teaching style, he spoke with authority. And you're seeing his authority right now when he says, but I say unto you, during that day, as is true to this day, when a teacher would teach the word of God, very often they would uh, refer to a commentator or their source, if you will. So very often when I give a quote, you'll hear me say, it has been said or whatever. And I'm actually referencing another person who has made a comment. And that's how the rabbis would, would teach. But not so with Jesus. You have heard it said by those of old or to those of old, but I say unto you, now, what are you saying, Jesus, with your authority? Well, basically, he's simply saying, resist beginnings. Now, what does that mean? Stop the train before it begins moving down the track. What does that mean? I don't know. I just felt like saying it. No, what does that mean? Well, in James chapter 1, verses 19 and 20, James said, so then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath, 
For the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Stop it. Nip it in the bud before it gets so serious that you end up taking a man's life. That's basically what the Lord is speaking about there. The beginning of an act of murder is sinful anger and hatred. And that springs out of our human nature. And so murder is an act of the heart and not of the hands alone. Mark 7, 21 says, For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders. So why is this important for him to start out this way? Because this teaching destroys any self-righteousness that anybody can have. You see, the best of people in their hearts are in the same condition as the worst. As unflattering as this is, it speaks of our sinful condition, our sinful human nature. The decisive seat of evil, it has been said, is not in social and political institutions, but simply in the weakness and imperfection of the human soul itself. God, in Genesis 8.21, said in his heart, the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. And so this activity that, that can lead to murder is actually springing from an impure soul. And the point the Lord is making is everyone has broken this commandment at one time or another because in reality, murder is simply hate that is ripened into deed. Notice how he says in verse 22, whoever is angry with his brother without cause is in danger. And he actually gives escalating degrees of anger and corresponding results penalties. He speaks of being angry. When he speaks of being angry with your brother without cause, that word angry speaks of that brooding, simmering anger. It's that holding a grudge. Now, now let's be theoretical, because I know nobody in this room has ever held a grudge. I realize that. I'm speaking to people who've never done that. It's that, that person injured me, and I just can't get past it. They have said something about me or done something and it has bothered me so much, I just can't let it go. And you brood over it. You think about it. And you don't let it go. You mentally have grasped it and held fast to it. It's, a, it's like in a cage in your mind and you will not open the, the, the cage door to let it go. It stays there. It's like a pet. And before you know it, you just brood over the same thing. They injured me. They injured me. They injured me. And it makes me so upset. It's holding a grudge. Somebody once said this. He said, you know, whenever I get into an argument with my wife, she gets historical. A and his friend said, you mean hysterical? No, historical. She brings up everything I've done. <laughs> and, and, and it's possible, isn't it? Isn't it possible for us to have a list of things that were done to us by somebody and, and it injured us and we brood over it? We just think about it. We don't want to let it go. Jesus said it begins there. It begins when we don't release things that we should release and we just hold on to them and harbor them. As a result of that, we actually go into name calling. That word raka, we don't use a word like that. We don't even use the word that has been described, the word is to describe the word uh, raka. The word raka is called, it's empty headed. It, and some have used the, the, the word blockhead. And it's just, it's just an insult because what happens is I'm now holding a grudge and before you know it, I begin to just vent and I, I begin to use some, some words to describe this guy and then it goes to fool. That word fool there is actually escalating. The word fool means stupid, moronic. It speaks of a godless fool and it gets to character assassination. The Lord is simply saying there are degrees of anger that lead to degrees of results that ultimately end when unforgiven and you die in that condition, you end up going to hell because your heart is so impure. That's a pretty strong thing, but it's true. The penalty is hellfire when you reject God's offer of forgiveness. So Jesus is revealing an increasing degree of seriousness from simmering anger. You become enraged, which when unchecked, leads to physical activity, even murder. Now, there's something that's an aside, if you will, but actually has some, some depth to it when you begin to consider it. What's the problem with getting angry? If somebody bugs you, you just let them know. Or you say things about them or take it out on them later on. What's the problem with that kind of anger? Well, 
anger actually is very destructive in many ways, but that kind of anger actually destroys relationships. It destroys your relationship with God, and it destroys relationship with other people. You see, true religion produces love for one another, not hatred. And the Lord Jesus Christ would have us to know that self-righteous externalism will never foster love for somebody else. What it does, it actually, when I'm self-righteous, it, it produces in me a mentality of one-upmanship, if you will. Because legalism, when I'm trying to make myself look good on the outside, always leads me to want to one-up somebody else who might be also considered righteous. And Jesus created a community. And the community that he's creating is a community of brothers and sisters. And here's the thing that's really important about that is this community called the church today, this community has been created with many purposes, one of them being the purpose of loving one another. In Ephesians chapter 4, verses 2 and 3, Paul said it like this. He said, be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other. Make an allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Always keep yourselves united in the Holy Spirit. Bind yourselves together with peace. When Paul was writing to the Roman church in chapter 13 of the book of Romans, in verse 10, he simply said it like this. He said, love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. So when a person harbors a grudge, you cannot truly worship God. And so the way for us to be able to really worship God is through the act of reconciliation. Notice what he said in verse 23 and 24. If you bring your gift to the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar, go your way, first be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. See, reconciliation is the key to truly worshiping God in spirit and in truth. My mom, my mom was outspoken. Some of you perhaps knew my mom. She's gone home to be with the Lord. But mama was outspoken. I remember on one occasion, I was maybe seven years old or so. We went to a store to purchase some shoes. So mom took me into the store. It was in the evening. I still remember that. And we walked into this shoe store. And this good size shoe salesman got rude to my mom. Just was rude to her. My mom wasn't the kind of woman you could get rude to. She just wasn't that kind. He got rude with her. And my mom turns and looks at me. I still remember her doing that. You wait here. <laughs> so she follows this guy. He walked away and he went into this back room to check on some shoes or whatever. And she followed after him. Now me, I followed after my mom. What's going to happen? And the guy, I still remember, he was kneeling down and there were some shelves and he was pulling some shoes off of a shelf. And my mom stood over him. And she said to him something I've never forgotten. Just to tell you, my mom was outspoken. She said, I don't appreciate the way that you spoke to me just now. I'm going to go home, and I'm going to tell my husband what you just did. And she said to him, my husband is short, but he can jump real high. <laughs> That's what my mom... <laughs> he apologized. He apologized. That was my mom. She was outspoken. She was one of these people that you just couldn't say something to her without her having a quick response. That was my mom. She had a fiery temper. She got saved. And God's doing a work in this woman's life. But one day she's speaking to me and she says this, and I was in my early 20s when she said this, but I've never forgotten. Mama was speaking to me and she says, David, she goes, I love the ministry. I love the ministry. I love serving God. It's people I can't stand. <laughs> and I laughed and I said, Mama, people are the ministry. 
You need to understand that. You know, and it's easy for us to like certain things and not to like the people who are involved in those things. Well, John in 1 John 4, 20 said it like this. He said, if someone says, I love God, but hates a Christian brother or a sister, that person is a liar. For if we don't love people as the people we can see, how can we love God whom we haven't seen? That's true. If I say I love the invisible God, but I can't stand those whom he loves, then I really don't have a relationship with him. Reconciliation. It's all about love. It's all about the grace of God. It's all about forgiveness. It's all about letting it go. It's all about just saying, God, use me and, and work in me. Fill me with your spirit and help me to let go of these things because my nature, my inclination of nature, I can want to get even. I can simmer. I can brood. I can say things. I can be vicious. God, I don't want to go there. I want to love you. It takes um, faith and the decision of the will. It takes uh, that willingness to let things go, to move to where you're supposed to be, to learn to love instead of wanting to get even all the time. Some of us don't know how to love. We're still learning. I was 17 and decided to go see my girlfriend. I had a girlfriend at that time when I was in high school. Her name was Terry. I lived in Norwalk. She lived in Whittier. I climbed in my car, drove from my house. It was in the evening, drove to Whittier to go and see her. It was a surprise visit. I didn't tell her I was coming over to see her. I pulled my car up into the front, parked there at the curb, climbed out of the car, began to walk up the driveway, the um, garage was one of these garages that the driveway just drove straight into it. It was attached to the house in the front of the house. And as I walked up, I heard the door, and I heard movement, actually, by the door in the front. And suddenly, there's Terry standing there at the corner. Oh, I thought she was excited to see me. I was real thrilled. Hi, Terry. Hi, what are you doing here? Oh, I just wanted to see you, just wanted to say hi. You know, I wasn't doing anything. Decided to drive in just to see you. Oh, and she's kind of awkward. I don't know why she's being awkward when the front door opens up and her father's standing there and you could see the light coming out of the front door. Though I was on the side, I couldn't really see it. Just the light, I could see the light. And then I hear this voice. It's her father and, and he says, Terry, make up your mind. You've got Scott here on the front porch, and you've got David there by the garage. Which one is it going to be? <laughs> and I was stunned, stunned. And she's just mortified. And I look at her with this, like you shot me, look. And I go to my car, and I have to drive home, and I'm broody, I'm angry, I'm stirred up all the way home. So by the time I get to the house, I swing the door open, I step in dramatically saying, I will never love again. <laughs> <laughs> Ever. And I start swearing, using these real bad words. Never. I was so angry, so betrayed, and I was screaming, I'm going to kill him. I will kill him. Mama says, David, please don't. And so the phone <laughs> rings, and it's Terry, and she's, blah, 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 blah. and I'm going, oh, whimper, whimper, whimper. And I, I, my mama speaks to me, and I've never forgotten what she said. She said to me, love, David, never stop and don't be afraid of it. It's the only thing that matters in life, is love. And if you at this age decide that you will never trust or care or love somebody, you're making a huge mistake, son. And my mom said this to me. She said, love until your heart breaks. Love until your heart breaks. I took her advice. I took her advice. Instead of carrying grudges and being angry at 
things people have done to you. And I could give you a list of things that have been said about me over the years that are so unkind. So many things. So many ungracious things. So many things. If you choose to always stir those things up. Well, Billy Graham's wife said it best. She said, every cat knows that some things need to remain buried. And that's true. You just leave them alone. You take them before the Lord. And you say, God, I will not become bitter. I will not become bitter over these things. I don't want to harbor grudges. I don't want to simmer in anger. I want to release them into your hand because that's what believers do. In Ephesians chapter 4, verses 30 through 32, Paul said, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice and be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, just as God in Christ forgave you. Forgiveness. That's something we learn through Jesus Christ. God demonstrated his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Even when we were in hostile opposition to him, our minds were in constant argumentation against him and his righteous standards. When we were just his enemies, he demonstrates to us his love, even as sinners, and he gave his son. And so Jesus would be pointing us, and we'll be seeing this ultimately, I'm just getting ahead, but he'll be pointing us to that grace that he gives to us that enables us to be forgiving people. He says in verses 23 and 24, if you bring your gift to the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar. Go your way. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Agree with your adversary quickly while you're on the way with him. Lest your adversary deliver you to the judge. The judge hand you over to the officer and you be thrown into prison. Assuredly, I say to you, you will by no means get out of there till you have paid the last penny. I was an assisting pastor. The senior pastor for s several months was mocking and hurting me. I would come home and I would tell my wife, Marie, the Lord is moving me. It's time to go. And at that time, Marie thought that I was just overly sensitive. She thought I was wanting to quit. But in fact, I had been the punching bag every Monday night at meetings for some time. I was only 29, 30 years old at the time, 30 years old at the time. I was still growing up. I didn't know how to handle that. And I would come home and I would tell Marie, I need to move on. And she would say, in her sweet and gentle way, man up. So I did. I held fast. Every week I'd come back beaten and beaten and beaten emotionally. Finally, I told her I can't do this anymore, and I began to weep at the house after one of the meetings. I said, I was a target again. This has been going on so long. I can't do this anymore. And what I had done is I had begun to, instead of dealing with it with the pastor, I began to speak to one of the guys there who was uh, a friend of mine, and, and it was just not a proper thing to do. I was simmering, I was getting angry, and now I was beginning to open up just like Jesus said I shouldn't do. That's what I was doing. And Marie finally said, you have to do whatever you think you need to do. And I had waited so she'd be on the same page with me over this, and when she finally said that, the next week I go to the meeting, and this time the senior pastor with the board, and the board was made up of 12 of us. He says before the board, David, you're not a pastor. You're a counselor. What you need to do is go back to school, finish your degree. We're gonna reduce your salary by 50%. We're removing your ordination, and you will be a church counselor, but you're not a pastor because you're not called to be a pastor. 
And I still remember looking at him at that time saying, there's only one thing I know that I'm called to do, and that's to be a pastor, but it's obvious that it's not here. Therefore, I resign my position. I give you two weeks' notice. And the board that was there that day, why are you going to... And I said, I need to do that. And so at first they began to argue, but I said, no, it's time to resign. One of the men, his name was Dan, said, I will not receive your resignation, David, because I know you're called by God. And I said, I truly appreciate your vote of confidence, Dan, but I am resigning, and I will not remain here. And so the board took the vote the 10 of the board members all agreed to receive my resignation. Dan would not vote for it. He abstained or actually opposed it. He said, nay. They received my resignation. I walked out the front door, closed the door behind me. Dan stood next to me. And again, I was 30 years old. I looked into his eyes and I said, it's all over. And I began to weep like a baby. And I remember just putting my head on his shoulder and just crying like a child. It's over. I went home. I told my wife. I resigned. And she shot me. No, she, um, <laughs> she said, let's see what God wants to do. Two weeks later, we planted this church. That's how this church came to be. But I had unresolved business. Planted the church, did our ministry. A year went by. The Holy Spirit awakened me one morning. It's time to reconcile with the senior pastor. I called the church. I said, I'd like to speak to you. I spoke to him. I want to talk to you. He said, about what? I said, about this last year. We need to speak. He said, let me see if I have time for you. He made some time for me. I came in, sat down with him. It got very loud in that office. He was yelling at me, and I responded with anger back, so loud that his new assistant came walking into the back to make sure we weren't killing each other. It was very loud. And that's how, that's how it came down. And it calmed down. Then we began to be honest. And then we asked each other for forgiveness. We prayed for one another. I stood up to leave. He hugged me. I hugged him in return. I said, I love you, my brother. He said, I love you too. I walked out that door. I never turned back. I never looked back. Because that's what reconciliation does. That's what reconciliation does. It can go from brooding anger to violence. It does. You have to nip it in the bud. With the grace of God, you can forgive. With the grace of God, you can release it. We'll see this. I'll be teaching out of Matthew, and Jesus speaks concerning debt collecting and forgiveness, because in reality, the word forgive can very often be translated to release someone from a debt. And Somebody may owe me something, and I'm going to make them pay. And I'm just going to stay there and make sure that they pay that debt off. When what I have to do is release them from that and let God do his work. I stand ready. Should they ever come and say, forgive me, then I'm ready to forgive. But if I've been brooding and simmering and angry and, and gossiping, and, and it's been getting and escalating beyond and beyond, then I'm, it, it's more destructive. It's destructive for me and my relationship with God and others. It's bad with my relationship with that person. And the Lord says, when you go to the altar and you bring your gift, if you remember that your brother has ought against you, go and be reconciled to that man. When he speaks of this gift, the gift was more, more than likely what was called a free will offering. It was given as an act of faith. It was a voluntary offering that was normally associated with gratitude to God. So Jesus says, before you make this kind of offering, examine your heart. Unresolved conflict must be settled so that peace can exist in the family of God. Do everything that you can to be resolved and reconciled with somebody else. Because true worship 
is not built simply on gospel messages and singing and praying or even in the giving of our gifts. It is built on relationships first with God and then with others. To be healed, we have to be courageous. We need to do the difficult thing because open confession and forgiveness is a pathway to reconciliation. And James 5.16 says, confess your faults one to another. So if you have a problem, we do our best to reconcile and we can have peace and we can move on. You see, when Jesus said, agree with your adversary quickly, the time for reconciliation, as is true with salvation, is always now. It takes faith, it takes determination, it takes humility, it takes the power of the Holy Spirit for this to happen. But it can. And if you don't humble yourself and don't confess, you don't have peace with God or anyone else. And unrepentant sin is always dealt with. If you don't repent and you remain in your sin in the context of this passage, if your righteousness is like the scribes and Pharisees, which is all external but not real, and you've done your best to have an appearance of being a righteous person, but you're not right with God, and you die in that condition, then ultimately you will stay in the condition of being judged. Unrepentant sin is always dealt with. In 1 John 3, 14 and 15, it says, We know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brother abides in death. Whoever hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Cain was of the evil one, and he rose up and slew his brother Abel. So the point is, either we're going to be like what Jesus would have us to be, born again with the new nature and loving and forgiving, or we're really going to retain that nature that was the kind of nature Cain had, which was an unrepentant nature that led him to kill his own brother. The grace of God is what we all need. If we tried to be righteous as the Pharisees were, Jesus said, your righteousness needs to exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. But how's that possible? It's possible by the grace of God and not by man's fleshly self-efforts. If God is speaking to your heart today and you've been trying to improve yourself, you can't. The way to improvement is to die to yourself. Say, God, be merciful to me. I am a sinner. I need your help. Forgive me first. And as you've forgiven me, teach me to forgive others so that I might really be your child. I want to be your child.